dear colleagues, dear course directors, dear members, dear colleagues and friends. So the question I will try to address in a few minutes before closing officially Asia PCR Sing Life uh, 17 is um, what to expect interventional cardiology, what to expect in 2017. Sometimes you learn from the past, so what happened in 2016, and we reviewed this in, in an article in the European Heart Journal published just recently. 2016 was a year of changes in the interventional landscape. Nothing new, you will tell me, but perhaps the speed and the extent of the change in 16 was quite significant. We've seen the release of uh, new imported randomized data on uh, left main PCI, confirming by and large what has been the practice in the area for many years. We've been painfully aware of the sobering midterm outcomes of bioresorbable scaffolds, very innovative technology that certainly will play a role in the future, but we have a little bit of, a, of an issue to fix first. I'll come back to it in a second. What's been extremely uh, fascinating is to witness the fast progress in structural and valvular intervention that's really becoming an important part of interventional practice and it will continue to increase beyond coronary intervention. And we've also seen um, the fact that uh, UCOMET, which is the organization of the device-based industry in Europe, has issued a new code of ethics and that is going to be implemented over the next few years in Europe but for there's no doubt that will this will also have an impact uh, worldwide so what to expect in 2017 I've listed here uh, what I think we might expect we're going to continue to see advances in mitral intracuspid intervention TAVI is already established but we see that it is a lot of effort in mitral intervention, both repair and replacement, and also tricuspid now is on the horizon. There is enormous amount of R&D uh, that goes into uh, this field, and we're actually already seeing in the mitral space some clinically useful uh, solutions to be progressively implemented in patient care. For sure, we will continue to see an expansion of the indications for TAVI versus surgical aortic valve replacement. We will see new data released on the, uh, bioresorbable scaffolds. And uh, it's important to mention that there is um, quite a number of ongoing trials on device-based therapies of arterial hypertension, be it specifically renal denervation or other technologies. Not that, it w that we will see many of, the, of these trials um, showing results in this year, but they're actually ongoing, meaning that 2018 will be perhaps the year where uh, these data are going to be released. Just a few more words about the expansion of the indications for TAVI and the new data to be expected on scaffolds. So this was presented actually at uh, PCR-CIT uh, China Chengdu Valve meeting by surgeon by a surgeon from PCR family discussing the evolving patient selections for TAVI between surgery on the left, considered the state of the art or the main, main therapy until now, and TAVI, the challenger, on the right. As you recall, there is, um, depending on the risk of the patient to undergo surgery, TAVI has played an increasing role. At the very extreme part of the slide, you see patients where the risk is so high or perhaps comorbidity is so important that even uh, a patient-friendly procedure like TAVI could become futile, so no indication. Then initially TAVI was uh, offering a fantastic solution to patients who had no hope and had no other option but medical therapy, which basically is no therapy. And then it was extended progressively as the technique improved, the devices became better, uh, the pre, peri, and post procedural care uh, improved. We're going more and more to the left, and there is no question that this trend will continue to increase both in practice as well as uh, confirmed by trial data. The other point that I'd like to briefly mention is the scare regarding 
the very late stent, uh, scaffold thrombosis that came out uh, later in 2016. The numbers are low, but they're actually uh, still disturbing because they're higher than what we can obtain with metallic stents. So this will lead to the perhaps anticipated release of long-term long data um, at ACC and also at EuroPCR this year. Actually, if you talk about new data to be released this year, this is the tentative list of hotlines or late-breaking uh, sessions that we will have at EuroPCR this year. And it spans from coronary intervention uh, to structural um, use of uh, protection devices during TAVI. Of course, uh, coronary, as I mentioned, um, also very important data, randomized data on the use of TAVI, both clinically in terms of indications like SIRTAVI, as well as comparisons of, of new devices. So lots of new evidence to be released this year. Coming back to my list, I'd like to finish by say a few words about uh, what's happening to the Stand for Life implementation project. And I also like to mention that just as we have seen that it took perhaps 10 years to implement worldwide and improve patient access to primary PCI or reperfusion therapies for STEMI, we will continue to see a slow, too slow, but still um, a progressive implementation of interventional treatment of acute ischemic stroke. And in some areas, interventional cardiologists are going to play a role. Now, what about Stand for Life? Now, Stand for Life, as you know, has been an implementation uh, program for, um, that was uh, launched in Europe in a number of European countries in order to improve patient access to reperfusion for STEMI, be it first choice primary PCI or when not available thrombolysis or combined pharmacoinvasive strategy. So what this slide shows is the result, measured result, of implementing Stand for Life in a number of countries, from Bulgaria on the left to Ukraine on the right. And each bar shows what happened prior versus post implementation of the Stand for Life program. This program is really owned locally by the uh, medical societies and the communities in each country. Now, if we take, for instance, um, Bulgaria at the extreme left, before Stand for Life, about 50% of the patients suffering from acute MI did not receive any reperfusion therapy at all. No stent, no primary PCI, not even reperfusion with thrombolytics. This is the dark black uh, part of the uh, bar here. And you see that after implementation of the program, globally, the proportion of patients receiving reperfusion therapy went from something like 50% to close to 70, and also that the proportion of patients receiving reperfusion through primary PCI increased from 20 to nearly 60%. And in every country where the program has been implemented, we have witnessed these changed um, the most dramatic one, for instance, is in Turkey, or at least in some regions of Turkey, where you see that uh, we are going from a, a non-reperfusion rate from nearly 60%, 60% patients receiving no reperfusion treatment whatsoever, to uh, less than 5% in those five or six uh, uh, regions from Turkey where the program was implemented. Likewise, access to primary PCI, for instance, went from less to 10% to nearly 80%, thanks to the implementation of this project. So you can imagine the impact on the lives, on the economy of those countries. And this has been studied now in four pilot regions, Romania, Portugal, the Basque area from Spain, and one part of Siberia, that's uh, Kemerovo uh, district. And we have very good numbers of the impact, uh, cost effectiveness impact, economic value of implementing those programs um, in, in those regions. Let me show you in detail, very briefly, but I think it's really an important slide to reflect on in the region here. This is from Kemerovo, so it's Siberia. And it shows over a number of years from 2015 to 2018 what has been the impact of Stand for Life 
on economy, economic metrics, so taking into account what it costs to implement access to primary PCI and eventually what is the value for the uh, society. So the graph looks complicated, but in fact it isn't. You have this horizontal line. Anything above the horizontal line, S0, is millions, in this case I think it's in dollars, millions spent for the program, and you see that it goes up to 2.7, okay, over these uh, three years, and everything that is below the line is savings. So we've invested, the community has invested 2.7 million euros or dollars, sorry, in the region to implement the program, and this has resulted in a, uh, if you look then at the savings down there, you see we have the indirect cost um, estimated from mobility to the society, the indirect cost in red that is, um, can be uh, ascribed to the mortality of those patients, and then the most important of the four lines is the one uh, with the squares, which is the uh, net result. So that's the nest variable cost saving from implementing the program. So two messages, first of all, if you invest what's needed, 2.7, to implement the program, that's the cost. You will actually save um, a tremendous amount of um, economic value, 3.2 million in the end for that particular region. And you do so by saving lives, 304 lives saved during that period with a very significant a very significantly positive uh, cost efficiency model analysis and we have similar results in the other three regions where this was analyzed. So showing that the impact of an implementation strategy that is to say working with the community to uh, ground patient access to these therapies has a very significant impact. So this is what we have achieved in, in Europe with this program and the good news is that um, now the program will actually be uh, internationalized, and it has started a while ago, but it's going to take a new impetus in two ways. First of all, Chris Neighbor is now uh, appointed chairman of the initiative. It will receive a new name because it goes worldwide. It's called now Stent Save Alive, but it's really about offering reperfusion therapies to patients worldwide, and you see that Latin America is going to engage with the help of the national and international societies there, there under the leadership of Solasi. Uh, Africa has started a couple of uh, years ago with the help of Pascar and uh, colleagues from uh, South Africa and in the region as well. There have been already very significant efforts, only to mention uh, Dr. Ong, but um, this now will receive also more attention in the region here. So new uh, opportunity for reperfusion therapies in patients with acute coronary syndromes through an internationalization of the uh, Stand for Life program. So finally, it was mentioned already, it's a special year. From the above, um, what is clear is that if, if you were considering not to attend Europe PCR this year, I would discourage you to do so. I think this is not the year to skip your PCR because of all the new stuff that will be presented, but also because it's going to be a year of celebration. 40 years of balloon angioplasty, you've seen it already, September 16th, 1977. Ironically, the same 16th, but in April 2002, the first TAVI, so it's 40 years of angioplasty and 15 years of TAVI. So we will be commemorating 40 years of PCA, 15 years of TAVI at EuroPCR, but at every PCR course, and we will finish here at Asia PCR 2018. Now, it's not about the past. It's about sharing with the younger generation where we come from, the roots, and the progress that has been made with collaboration between interventional cardiology community and our industry, our device-based industry. So, I saw, um, just before coming here, this ad, Wanted, Thinking Tinkerers Who Learn to Create New Possibilities. So this inspired me the following. 
Uh, I'm going to paraphrase um, a famous uh, U.S. president who said, um, don't ask yourself what interventional cardiology will offer you in 17. You know, we should ask ourselves what we can offer to interventional cardiology in 2017. And this ad here comes from the Singapore Institute of Technology, right? So I said, well, this is about interventional cardiology because I don't know about, you know, my English is not, is not good. So I had to think twice, what is a thinkerer? The thinker is us, yeah? It says on the website, a thinking tinkerer is someone who isn't just passionate about hands-on experimentation, but also able to think and apply the knowledge picked up during the process. He or she is skilled with his or her hands and also seeks knowledge in the classroom. Hence, he is constantly or she is constantly looking to improve things and solve practical problems with innovative solutions. That sounds like us, that sounds like our community, that sounds like our collaboration with our device-based industry. So this is the inspiration that I would like to send us all home with, and this is what 2017 should be about. Thank you very much.